Hello and thank you for joining us. My name is Louise Martin Chu and with Matthew Wengert, I am the John Oxley Fellow for 2019. Hi, I'm Matthew Wengert. Uh, I'm a historical researcher and writer. Our fellowship project is called Designs, Details, Devils, a visual history of Queensland's government printing office. And before we tell you what we've found, we'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this place we know as South Brisbane, um, the Turbal and the Jagera people, and we acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. We'd like to begin by talking about why we called it Designs, Details, Devils. Queensland's government printing office made an extraordinary contribution to the documentation of Queensland history through the very ordinary work it did every day and every year over a century and a half. It printed things for every government department and agency, from parliament to the police, from education to mining, from health to tourism. Its work involved details of all sorts, details that kept the economy and the population informed and up to date. It was a centre of design work, creating graphics and illustrations that would capture the essence of different eras and have clearly endured into the future. And it was staffed by the devils, who proudly took on the emblem of the printer's devil to define, define themselves and their work. And why a visual history? In many ways, and quite literally, the work done by the printing office is itself a major thread of the documented history of Queensland. Everything printed and published by every part of the government for the whole of the state. We decided early that it would not be possible for a pair of researchers to attempt an overall history of the printing office in a single year, but we could work towards a visual history, one that uses the printed objects as markers or milestones on the much wider general history. The QGPO's mission was to produce objects to be read, to be seen and sometimes to be written on. Its entire reason for being was to create material for visual consumption. Sometimes it was page after page of words and numbers, everyday details informing people decade after decade. Think of time train timetables and tide timetables pages of statistics, economic and medical. Other times it was glamorous and gorgeous work, sensational or spectacular, designed to entice and invite people to a ball or a banquet, or maybe a family holiday on the Barrier Reef. So what was the central and crucial importance of print in this era? So many things can go wrong with paper and printing. That's where the notion of printer's devils came into being to excuse the blemishes and mistakes that seem to always happen during the process. You could blame the devil. Paper is soft, fragile and thin. Paper hates water as much as it fears fire. Various bugs like to eat it. But high quality paper made by traditional methods going back many centuries can endure for many more centuries. When carefully handled and stored, Printed objects will remain visually clear and vivid for hundreds of years. Printing is a great technology for recording and storing information because it is durable and portable. It can live a long time, just as it can be sent through the postal system, and it doesn't require software updates or hardware upgrades. Queensland State Library, and particularly the John Oxley Library, has an extensive collection of material printed by the printing office, numbering in the thousands of individual objects, of which we're going to show you just a few. The Queensland Government Printing Office had a major role in defining Queensland. It took a few years for Queensland to get into its stride, following separation from New South Wales in 1859. The new government used existing local commercial printers to document essential functions such as parliamentary bills and debates and administrative appointments to the public service, such as magistrates, police officers, postal staff, surveyors, and so on. The government printers themselves 
were the general managers of the printing office. The Queensland Government Gazette recorded crucial official information, such as this particular volume's notice of the appointment of the first governor printer in 1862. The government printer was legally responsible for the work undertaken by the printing office. During the first 40 years of the printing office, only three government printers held the position, beginning with William Belbridge, then James Beale and Edmund Gregory. We have a portrait of Gregory to show you. He had a really long career in printing and publishing in early Brisbane. He became government printer in 1893 and held the position until 1902, but he'd worked at the printing office as an overseer since 1866. Gregory was a newspaper man. He'd founded the Ipswich Herald in 1859 and ran the Courier Printing Office for T.B. Stevens before becoming overseer of the government printing office in 1866 and then government printer in 1893. One of his best known published works is the story of the wild white man, James Murrell, whom he interviewed personally and published a book about in 1863. One of the items from the John Oxley collection that I wanted to show you is a print made from an engraving of a drawing that Gregory did of Brisbane around 1865, a very early drawing of Brisbane. This charming little drawing was not printed in or by the government printing office, but one of the buildings identified in the cityscape is the government printing office in William Street. The printing office took over nearly all government printing in 1862 and the relentless work continued to grow over the decades as the economy and population also grew. These decades as a self-governing colony saw all kinds of documents printed under the ultimate authority of Queensland. The state named for Queen Victoria who was represented by her governors and the parliament with its Hansard legislation and regulations to outline diverse aspects of daily life, such as education, health, agriculture, mining and roads, as well as railways that needed their own rules, timetables and millions of tiny printed tickets. Our new colony also needed its own postal stamps and duty stamps for financial transactions and of course it needed currency, money in the form of pound notes. Currency had to defy counterfeiting so banknotes were really intricately designed and engraved to make it difficult to forge. Here's one from 1866. And while the government's regulations kept the economy operating within standard rules, beginning with real estate, selling the land itself, which required surveyors. Not everyone was inclined to obey the laws in their pursuit of money. So the colony needed police and prisons. The printing office printed the laws and it also printed the guidelines and forms used by surveyors to define real estate and the many requirements of the police department and the prisons and the courts and so on. This reward poster is interesting because it appears to have been printed on the day of the crime, which shows the versatility of the printing office in carrying out the many different types of work it was given. This one's from 1867. The same kind of technical skill and aesthetic sensibility required for printing banknotes and debentures and so on was also required for the precise demands of map printing. By the late 1860s, Queensland's government printing office was producing maps that were as good as any in the world. This is evidenced by the maps themselves, such as this exquisitely engraved map of North Queensland from 1868. But research by Bill Kitson at the Museum of Mapping and Surveying indicates that the British Admiralty only trusted one printer outside of England to print its charts, and that was here in Brisbane. The Aboriginal Protectors reports were also printed by the Queensland Government Printing Office, amongst other reports which ranged from royal commissions, which happened quite frequently, to parliamentary debates 
and these are voluminous, to geological observations and the opium trade. I think amongst the most interesting of these reports, and so important to Queensland's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, are the reports of the Aboriginal protector. The first of these reports was a precursor to the Aboriginal Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act. This report from 1895 by Archibald Meston, who went on to become Southern Protector of Aboriginals, was published two years prior to the passing of the Act and advocated for the Act's establishment and for the segregation of white and Aboriginal communities. His case argues that such measures will improve the situation for Australia's First Nations people in Queensland. While Queensland parliamentary speakers lauded the Act as an exemplar of Christian compassion and humanitarianism, a determined effort to ameliorate conditions of the Aborigines and to save a dying race from extinction, it in fact went on to represent the imposition of control over almost every aspect of an Aboriginal person's life. Forced removal to missions and reserves was integral to the Act. It was also a convenient mechanism for colonists, as was the widespread belief that Aboriginals were a dying race. Colonists were keen to use land for farming and grazing without having to deal with Australia's resident and dispossessed Aboriginal people, many of whom were understandably aggrieved at the theft of their country and the destruction of their agriculture and aquaculture. Despite his purported encouragement of traditional practices, after 19, 1897, Meston was responsible for the removal of 19 Aboriginal individuals from their own country to be dispatched to the first Aboriginal mission on Fraser Island, Kigari. Taking Aboriginal people from their own country was traumatic. The bundling together of groups with no previous association or even common language was further scarifying. It all went very wrong. After the Act was passed, the Queensland Government printed off the Printing Office printed annual reports every year. These are poignant in their documentation of the situation of Aboriginal people all over the state. Numbers, opium use, schooling, distribution of blankets, flour and tobacco, the variety in their diet, and the Aboriginal sense of humour is all detailed here. To quote, fish of all kinds, including the turtle, various kinds of shellfish, kangaroos, wallabies, opossums, iguanas, birds, snakes, wild honey or sugar bag, which is very abundant, the native fig, the bunya fruit, and several kinds of berries, all contribute to furnish on their multifarious bill of fare. They have a keen perception of the ludicrous and grotesque and a decided taste for what may be called dry humour. And their talent for mimicry is really wonderful. If there is anything uncommon or peculiar in the appearance or demeanour of any European in their district, or for instance, if he should be lame, if he has a proud, overbearing manner, or anything remarkable in his tone of voice, they are sure to take him off with the most ludicrous effect. These reports are detailed snapshots of this time in history. While their approach makes for outdated and often outrageous reading, the archival data that they give us with those difficult attitudes is precious. After defining Queensland, the printing office was helping to develop Queensland. Government printing went well beyond documenting the legislation and the administration of the state and in the early 20th century was used increasingly for marketing and propaganda purposes. One of the printing office's important clients was the Queensland Intelligence and Tourism Bureau, the QITB, 
It projected information and images of Queensland out to other states and other nations to sell it as a place to visit or to settle. The Bureau kept the printing office busy with diverse jobs, including booklets, posters and postcards. Widespread commercial printing in the early 20th century allowed for a boom in the production and sale of picture postcards, which were used to communicate with people across town or across the world. The QGPO printed tens of thousands of postcards for the QITB in the years around 1908 to 1913. They were freely distributed to anyone who asked for them as a way to promote Queensland. Hundreds of locations were featured on the front and the back of each card would mention economic statistics such as how many bananas were grown during a year or how many miles of railway tracks were laid across the state. Some special postcards were printed for international expositions in Europe and the United States and some cards were even printed with the novel language of Esperanto. Not all the postcards printed at the QGPO were made for the government. Lloyd Rees, who would become one of Australia's most distinguished painters, was a teenager when he was employed as a junior artist at the printing office in 1913. While working there, he produced sets of postcards based on his exquisite drawings of notable Brisbane buildings, which he sold in paper packets in bookshops. In one of his published memoirs, Lloyd fondly recalls his early work at the QGPO as being fundamental to his lifelong career as an artist. It's an historical irony that the government printer of the time, Anthony Cumming, asked young Lloyd to draw the QGPO building for a special lithograph to be given to important visitors. And this very early work appears to have been lost with no examples ever having found their way into an art gallery or a library collection. By the time the First World War rolled around, Recruiting posters were often aimed at women. This one, with the heroic figure of a woman in the centre, suggests that they send a man today to fight for you, with the prospect of suffering the fate of the women and children of European nations raised as a spectre. Visual references to classical sculpture also work the psychological message, as does the sunset with a fiery sky behind the central scene and the dead bodies of the children at this of this female figure. This was designed by J.S. Watkins from between 1866 and 1942 and the poster is dated 1915. The printing office did not just press ink onto paper. Its work involved diverse roles that contributed to what was printed and what happened after the printing artists, designers, statisticians, writers, cartographers were among the QGPO's huge workforce. One of the more oblique job titles there was knife sharpener, who kept the blades in the big machines ready for cutting paper all day, every day. Following the actual printing, pages were often bound into books and the bookbinders did some beautiful, elaborate work in gilt and leather for special books. When Governor Nathan arrived in Queensland in 1921, he was presented with a photo album made by the printing office with images of the various departments within the large organisation. This is a wonderful historical document that captures all the types of clerical, creative, intellectual and physical work done by the printing office. From ruling lines to maintaining heavy industrial equipment. The Golden Casket began as a revenue stream for building housing for Anzac veterans following the First World War and grew over successive decades to generate enormous income that funded medical research and construction of hospitals. Millions of tickets were printed 
and sold in what was a highly profitable form of state-sponsored gambling that also ended up benefiting Queensland's public health system. One of the devils we met was the government artist who designed the tickets, as well as the bold designs of posters that were displayed in newsagents to promote the golden casket. Druce Williams' name is not widely known, but as an artist, he was responsible for creating all the printed designs of not only the golden casket, but all the work for all the other government departments, including many of the school readers that generations of Queensland kids used in schools. Druce's design work was handled by millions of Queenslanders in the second half of the 20th century. He's an example of the highly skilled staff of the printing office. Finally, we'd like to speak a little more about the devils we have met, some of them very old, who worked at the Queensland Government Printing Office. While of the hundreds of people who worked there over its years of operation, there are only a handful who we have interviewed. However, in the main, they loved working there, and the pride they take in their work, even today, is palpable. This, this is evidenced by the fact that a few of them have kept this material with them, in and under their houses, all throughout their lives. A more recent example of the importance of the printing office work may be summed up by one gentleman who related that during the printing of the Fitzgerald Inquiry report, strict security prevented leaks. As the pages were rolling off the big printing machines, politicians and leading figures were being arrested. The corruption detailed in those pages often reverberated on those involved on the fringes. Queensland could be a dangerous place and those who printed the closely guarded secrets were subject to close scrutiny, scrutiny and enhanced security. The Fitzgerald Report became one of the printing office's best sellers running through multiple editions. In conclusion, we'd really like to thank the State Library for the privilege of undertaking this work, the QGPO, and its output documents the history of Queensland from 1859 till 2013. And it, this legacy really can't be overstated. Um, to all of those in the audience, if you have materials printed by the QGPO, um, please consider donating them to the State Library um, to assist researchers of every discipline in the future. We also thank the people from the QGPO who we interviewed, uh, particularly Druce Williams, George G, who unfortunately died earlier this year, Alice French, Joseph Tarnowski, Scott Aubrey, former general manager of GoPrint, Danny Doherty, State printing representative for the Australian Manufacturing Workers' Union, uh, Ted Faulkner, Brian Lewis, and Dale and Sylvia Absalom. We also thank Kay Nardella and Bill Kitson from the Queensland Museum of Mapping and Survey. Um, we, we thank Nicole Wittenberg, Peter Fishman, and the SLQ Queensland Memory Team, um, Chrissy Theodisio, Gavin Bannerman, Christine Drew, Joan Bruce, as well as the Queensland Library Foundation. It's been a pleasure working with all of you, thanks. <laughs>